Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this morning. We give you thanks every opportunity that we have to dig into your word and to seek greater understanding and wisdom that you have to share with us. Lord, I ask this morning that either because of me or in spite of me, that you bring a message to your people. All this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. One of the um, great things about being in a connectional system like in the Methodist Church is uh, when we when we were able to partner together with one another um, in putting together the sermon series uh, that we've, we've been doing, uh, we've partnered with Reverend Jen Karsner, uh, who's helped along with Pastor Trish to put together the series and write sermons and everything else. And every once in a while when we're a little bit stuck, we, we share back and forth the different sermons that we have. And uh, Reverend Jen shared hers with me, and I was going through, and while there's pieces in there that I've put in, she did such a great job on this that I couldn't improve upon it. It touched me, and it blessed me, so I'm going to be using uh, quite a bit of what she shared uh, for this morning, just because I think it'll bless you uh, as well. So um, I hope that you are as blessed as I was by it. So... While growing up, I did not have the luxury or experience of living in the same community uh, for very long. My dad traveled around. He worked for a company where he did troubleshooting, and they would send him different places to fix a problem. So some places we lived for maybe six months. Some places we lived for a year. Um, if I listed all the different places, I lived in Towson, Owings Mills, um, Ransom, West Virginia, Shepherdstown, West Virginia, Charlottesville, Virginia, Winchester, Virginia, Cockeysville, uh, only we called it Padonia at that time, and people tell me there is no Padonia, but I thought it was Padonia, uh, Perry Hall, and then Finksburg, and Westminster, and finally Parkton. So I've lived several places for, for quite a while, <clears throat> but I remember the time moving through... <clears throat> Virginia and West Virginia, we lived in four different places over the course of about five years. During that time, we didn't have extended family around for help with babysitting or picking us up if we were sick at school or things like that, or even just to get together for holidays and special occasions. With both my parents working long hours, raising two young children was challenging at times without the support of extended family around. There was no option for calling grandma to babysit for a night or of going to a cousin's ball game. It's a concept many of you here may be familiar with as well. In this day and age, more and more people know what it's like to live in a foreign land, to live far from family. We live in a world that is hyper-connected and yet more isolated than ever. We know what it's like to long for family, for a place to belong. In the same longing we see in our, it is the same longing we see in our scripture readings today. The book of Ruth is the story of Naomi and her daughter-in-law Ruth. Ultimately, Ruth is a story about what it means to be family. The story of Ruth begins, ironically, with death. There was a famine in the land. So Naomi, her husband, and her two sons left and went to Moab in search of food. They settled there, but Naomi's husband died. She and her sons remained in Moab, and her sons married Moabite women. This intermarriage between um, Jews and Moabites was strongly looked down on by the Jewish community. Repeatedly throughout Jewish history, when, pe when the people married outside the Jewish community, it led to idolatry. Those from other faiths brought their beliefs to the marriage, and it often resulted in the Jewish community being led astray from their sole devotion to Yahweh. Despite this injunction on intermarriage, Naomi's sons marry Moabite women, and they live in Moab for 10 years. Then Naomi's two sons die. She is left with no husband and no sons to provide for her, no grandchildren to carry on the family line. Not only is this sad, but it leaves her desolate. The situation of a widow was precarious. They relied on the kindness and generosity of others to care for them because they had no means of providing for themselves. 
This was especially true of widows without any living sons. <coughs> Out of care for her daughters-in-law, Naomi suggests that they return to their parents' homes and perhaps they can remarry and find security there. Orpa, and funny little thing, you've heard of Oprah Winfrey, right? Did you realize her name was a spelling error that they made when they were naming her? They were trying to name her Orpa, and it was spelled wrong, so it became Oprah. So anyway, just a little side note. So Orpah takes this advice, but Ruth clings to her mother-in-law and promises to stay with her, opting out of security to share a future with her mother-in-law. In some of the most well-known verses um, of scripture, Ruth says, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Or perhaps you are more familiar with the traditional King James Version. Whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. These are beautiful words. In part because of the rhythm and poetry of how they are written, but also because of the sentiment behind them. The danger, though, is when we get so caught up in the beauty of them that we miss out on the incredible implications that they offer. By refusing to go back to her family, Ruth is giving up her security. She gives up the opportunity to go back to her family who would care for her and provide for her until another suitable husband could be found for her. Instead, she chooses to stay with Naomi to risk a future not knowing how they will provide for themselves. Ruth has no obligation whatsoever to accompany Naomi back to Bethlehem, but she still chooses to go. It is a stunning decision, not only because she choose to, chooses to forsake her security, but also because she willingly chooses to go to a place where she will likely face blatant discrimination and hostility. Being seen as an outsider with dubious heritage and a propensity to lead the community astray. Yet Ruth refuses to go. She clings steadfastly to Naomi. The Hebrew of this passage is often translated as, Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. But Hebrew makes it unclear if this is a future possibility or a present reality. Ruth could just as likely be saying, your people are my people. Your God is my God. Therefore, where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. It is this act, perhaps even more than Ruth's marriage to Naomi's son, that makes them family. In this moment, they become a new family caring for each other. Ruth turns out to be a powerful and provocative provocative character in this story. As it turns out, Ruth is the instrument of God's faithfulness. Ruth becomes the means through which God redeems Naomi and brings about hope and a new future. When we look at Ruth, we should see the way God is at work in a broken system to bring about hope and a future for those in despair. Therein lies the real power of Ruth's words to Naomi. The truth is, we all know what it is like to long for family, to feel isolated and alone, to need a place to belong, a community that will cling to us, that will not leave us even when we try to push them away. We want to know that we are loved and cared for, that God won't abandon us no matter how desperate our situation becomes. It is through the words of Ruth that we hear the promises of God. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. For those who are going through a divorce, who feel as though their family is being torn, about, torn apart, God promises, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. For those whose loved one is sick or has died, God promises, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. For those who are stranded in the barren land of infertility, God promises, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. 
For those whose family enters into the foreign and sometimes hostile land of mental illness or addiction, God promises, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. For those, whatever, uh, for those who find themselves wandering the wilderness of unemployment, God promises, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Whatever those desolate and desperate places in your lives look like, God promises where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. It is a promise we see in the words of Jesus as well. In the gospel passage, Jesus talks about a new idea of family. He asks the rhetorical question, who is my mother and who are my brothers? In his answer, Jesus points to his disciples and says, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus completely redefines family for a community in which bloodlines were everything. Jesus insists that family is less about a circumstance of birth and more about those who share in his purpose. Those who are committed to living out God's call and working for God's kingdom on earth. Over the years, many different things have been pointed to as the culprit for undermining or destroying the family. But I think Pope John Paul II got it right when he said, the greater danger for family life in the midst of any society whose idols are pleasure, comfort, and independence lies in the fact that people close their hearts and become selfish. The greatest danger to family is when people close their hearts and become selfish. The thing that is most likely to unravel a family is a closed heart and selfishness. That is what is at the root of most family problems. It is what leads to divorce, sibling rivalry, tension between parents and children, resentment, and even isolation from our family. When we are really honest with ourselves, we can see how this is true in our own lives in big and in small ways. Family means being willing to put the needs of others before our own. It means being willing to sacrifice our own security so we can face the future together. The redef this redefinition of family is something that Jesus is thinking about even in his last earthly moments. As Jesus hangs on the cross, he looks down at his mother Mary and the beloved disciple and says to them, here is your mother and here is your son. Even with his dying breaths, Jesus is redefining family as those that care for one another, those that choose to be a community together, those that have the same values and share his vision of the kingdom of God. In Jesus' last words, Mary and the beloved disciple may have heard Ruth echoing in the background, where you go, I will go. In the Disney movie Lilo and Stitch, Two orphan girls struggle to take care of one another. In the midst of a disagreement about whether or not to return their new pet to the animal shelter, the little sister screams at her older sister, you can't send him back. He's family now, and family means no one gets left behind or forgotten. Family means no one gets left behind or forgotten. As we unite together in Christ's mission, we are all God's family. That is our charge as a community of faith. The charge is to remember that no one gets left behind or forgotten. That where we go, God goes. And where we stay, God stays. Traveling as a kid with my family, apart from our extended family and support network, we came to rely on our neighbors who in some cases became like family for us. We may not have shared the same blood, but we cared for one another as family cares for its own. That is how churches ought to be. One family, not of blood or birth, but chosen family united together in the same mission. God promises not to leave us or forsake us, but also charges us to do the same for others. 
it's a profound thing to realize that when we enter into the community, we become the presence of God there. Where we go, God goes. By show of hands, real quick, how many of you can think of a time when a member of the church has stepped in and been family for you? Anybody? In their actions, they were saying, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. And I encourage you during fellowship time, after church, over the course of the week, share some of those stories. Reflect on them yourself and realize that the presence of God was in the midst of that moment. That God was providing family for you in a time that you needed it. That even if it may not have been someone from your own bloodline, that they were family in that moment for you. When we as a church stand in the face of injustice and oppression, when we refuse to sit silently by in the face of racism, sexism, classism, or any other ism, we allow the echo of Ruth to rise up over the discriminating voices. Once again, the oppressed and desperate people hear God's promise, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. For better or worse, we are family. There may be times when we fight like only families can fight. <laughs> but in the end, we are called to cleave to one another as only family can. We are called to be the presence of God's redemptive work in the lives of one another and in the world. We are family. Family means no one gets left behind or forgotten. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. Thanks be to God. Amen.